This is the Mathematics Education Podcast from MathEdPodcast.com. Welcome to the Math Ed Podcast. My name is Sam Otten from the University of Missouri, and with me today is Emily Fife, who works in the Department of Psychological and Brain Sciences at Indiana University. Emily, thanks so much for being on the podcast. I'm happy to be here, Sam. We're going to be talking about Emily's article that is currently available in the Journal of Educational Psychology, and the article is entitled Assessing Formal Knowledge of Math Equivalence Among Algebra and Pre-Algebra Students. And Emily, I was wondering if you could just let us know the co-authors, the team that you worked with for this article. Of course. So I worked really closely with Percival Matthews, who's a professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Eric Amsel did a lot of the data collection at Weber State University. Catherine McElden, who's working for the Tennessee Department of Education. And Nicole McNeil, who's at the University of Notre Dame. And those two helped us a lot with the assessment and analysis of the project. Okay, great. And so that's going to really be digging into some ideas about math equivalence at the middle school level. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so I'm eager to talk to you about that article. But first, I always like to put people on the map. So I was actually curious if you could say a little bit about your graduate school experience and who you worked with there when you were getting your PhD. I would love to. So I got my PhD at Vanderbilt University from 2010 to 2015. And I worked with Dr. Bethany Riddle Johnson in their Department of Psychology. Uh, I spent most of my five years there working on topics like math equivalence with elementary school students and thinking about how children learn both independently and with guidance. And so the majority of my studies focused on how the effects of feedback influence children's problem solving in these kind of key math areas. And interestingly, we found that for low knowledge students, even really minimal feedback, so saying things like, you're right, that's the correct answer, can have really, really big benefits on their um, later learning outcomes. But for some students who already know a little bit about the topic, uh, they sometimes benefited from solving the problems um, completely by themselves without feedback. Yeah, and that was actually how I first came to know of your work was when you were reporting on some of that at a previous PMNA conference. Yes, I remember our meeting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but now um, working on math equivalence and taking it up to the middle school level. But first of all, I just want to make sure we're all on the same page with math equivalence. So what's the mathematical idea there? Why is it important? Sure. So math equivalence is really this basic idea that both sides of the equal sign need to be the same amount. And you can present this in kind of concrete objects or in symbolic numbers or in algebraic equations. It's a really critical uh, foundational topic, both in early arithmetic and in later algebra. But the problem is that a lot of students um, in the US kind of develop these misconceptions about math equivalence. So based on their kind of previous narrow arithmetic experience where they always see problems um, A plus B equals C, so the equal sign is always at the end, They kind of gather these misconceptions that the equal sign means find the answer, calculate the total, um, instead of reasoning about both sides of the equal sign. And so these misconceptions have been really well documented in elementary school and and starting to get documented now in middle school as well. And we want to kind of think about how can we assess this knowledge really well and how can we design interventions to improve this knowledge um, in young students. Yeah, so the goal is really to have a rich understanding of math equivalence where you can work flexibly and you can have things on the left, things on the right, Mm -hmm. you can rearrange them, but you always have this understanding that what I'm working with is always equal to the other side. That's what the ultimate goal is, right? Rather than just equals being, oh, I perform a computation and get a result. Right, yeah, we get really interesting mistakes from both elementary and middle school students. You can show them um, a problem like three plus seven equals 10 and they're completely fine with it. But if you say 10 equals 3 plus 7, they'll say, no, 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 that's backwards. <laughs> um, or you can get something like 3 plus 4 equals 5 plus blank. And instead of making both sides the same amount, they will just add all of the numbers they see, not noticing um, or caring that the equal sign is in the middle of the problem instead of at the end. And so we kind of think of these misconceptions as operational in nature. They tend to think about the equal sign as a do something signal, um, as opposed to the symbol that relates to amounts. And it leads to these really interesting errors and strategies that children can apply to um, lots of different problems, both in arithmetic and in algebra settings. 
And so you mentioned working with Riddle Johnson at Vanderbilt, and that provided a framework for math equivalence, but the framework was mostly used at the elementary level, if I understand correctly. But I was wondering if you could just really quickly tell us about that framework for these levels of understanding and working with math equivalence. Sure. So Dr. Bethany Riddle Johnson um, did some really early assessment work on math equivalence. So the goal is to think about how does um, knowledge become more sophisticated in this particular area of math equivalence, right? So if we kind of have a low knowledge learner, what is their knowledge looking like? If we have somebody who knows a little bit but not everything, what does their knowledge look like? And then if we have an expert, what does their knowledge look like? And so her goal was to kind of um, track this knowledge in elementary school students and think about how their knowledge progressed. And she set forth this progression where kids go from being strictly operational in their thinking, and so that is defining the equal sign as the total and adding up all of the numbers and all of the problems they see. And then eventually they get to be a little bit more flexible in this, so they might see something like three equals three, and there's no operations involved, but they're finally okay with that kind of problem. Mm -hmm. And then more sophisticated knowledge becomes relational in nature, and that's when you can start thinking about the equal sign as meaning both sides are the same amount. And so students start being able to deal really well with problems that have operations on both sides. They recognize really sophisticated uh, definitions of the equal sign. And then there's this one kind of level beyond that where you have this really sophisticated relational knowledge of the equal sign where you can think about how an equation is equal without doing any operations. You can just kind of look at it and notice that there's two more on this side, and so we need to have two more on this side without doing lots of um, extensive computations. Yeah, so that's the comparative relational level, level four, you refer to it in the paper. And the example that stuck out to me was like 67 plus 86 equals 68 plus 85. Mm -hmm. And so the first number ticked up by one, the second number ticked down by one. So that means actually that is still going to be equal. Even though I don't compute the actual sum Mm -hmm. to check, I actually just know it must be equal because I can see the compensation on each of the add-ins. So it works out. To me, that was kind of what I took in my mind as the level four kind of thinking. Exactly. And that's one of the things that distinguishes this kind of students who have this basic relational understanding and they can solve these um, math equivalence problems really well. But then this comparative relational understanding is this, um, I don't have to compute both sides of the equal sign to know they're the same because I can reason about these compensation. So there's one more on this number and one less on this number, so I don't need to worry about adding them together. I know that they're the same amount or I know that they're not the same amount. Mm -hmm. So with this framework in hand and having done work before at the elementary level, what was the goal of this particular study that's uh, available in the Journal of Educational Psychology? It's available online right now. It'll be coming in print later, but what were the real goals that this study took on? So there were a couple of goals. Um, One of the main ones was to make sure we could have a valid and reliable assessment of this math equivalence knowledge in older students. So more and more research is coming out showing that um, these misconceptions are not only prevalent in elementary school students, but there's a substantial portion of middle school students, and now sometimes even in college students, we're finding that these operational misconceptions are still kind of their dominant way of thinking about these problems. And so having a valid and reliable assessment gives us a few things. One, we can make sure um, that we're reliably assessing their knowledge and determining at what level they're thinking, right? Um, And also, if we're going to design interventions at this middle school level, we have a valid assessment to use in order to assess their progress along this progression. So they might start out, um, have a certain level of knowledge before the intervention, um, but then after the intervention, if we have these valid and reliable assessments, we can be ensured that there was indeed improvements or not improvements and improvements in certain areas. And so we really wanted to make sure we had a valid assessment that applied to these older middle school students in pre-algebra and algebra classes. Mm -hmm. And then kind of a secondary goal was to see if this knowledge of math equivalence as assessed on this kind of valid and reliable assessment was related to more formal algebraic reasoning tasks. And this is just to clear up this theoretical notion in the literature that yes, this kind of basic notion of equivalence and equality of the equal sign does in fact matter for how you reason about more sophisticated and complicated algebraic tasks. Mm -hmm. And then just briefly, um, for your methodology, what were the assessments that you administered and then who was it that you had taking the assessments and being part of the study? Mm -hmm. 
So in this study, we worked with over 200 um, students, primarily seventh and eighth graders, and they basically took a 31 item assessment. And this assessment has been used in previous research with elementary school students to assess their knowledge of math equivalents um, and to kind of validate this knowledge progression that these students go through. And so we had these you know, 200 plus students take this 31 item assessment that included different types of items. So some of the items were problem solving items, basically uh, fill in the missing blank or find the value of this variable. So eight plus four plus six equals eight plus blank, right? And we would hope they put 10 in that blank. Mm -hmm. Other items were um, more about the structure of the problems. So if you see a problem like 31 plus 16 equals 16 plus 31, based on the structure of that problem, can you judge correctly whether it's true or false? And then we had also just these equal sign items. So things like, can you define the equal sign? Um, is this a good definition of the equal sign? And things like that. So we've got equation solving, we've got equation structure, and we've got equal sign items. Mm -hmm. And then of those items, we tried to have them vary on this continuum. So some of them were more basic items and some were more complex. And we're trying to tap these different levels of knowledge with those items. And then uh, uh, in addition to the 31 item assessment, they did complete one um, kind of formal algebraic reasoning task where basically we have them interpret an algebraic expression. So this does not actually have the equal sign in the problem, but it is a really key uh, kind of mathematical object in algebraic classes. And so basically the question is, can you interpret an algebraic expression like 3x plus 3y? In the context of a story problem, I should say the actual problem says cakes cost C dollars each and brownies cost B dollars each. So suppose I buy four cakes and three brownies, what does 4C plus 3B stand for? And ideally we're trying to get um, students to understand that this entire expression stands for the cost of your purchase, right? It stands for the total cost of the cake and the brownies. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of students have this misconception and think it means the, the objects themselves. Yeah. So they might say, well, it means there's four cakes and three brownies. Yeah, it's the four cakes and three brownies instead of re or realizing that the C and the B represent like a unit cost. Yes, exactly. Yeah, we've talked about that kind of problem quite a bit here at Mizzou, <laughs> actually, because we've seen it with teachers, students, and undergrads. You know, we kind of take for granted that, oh, of course you have lots of meaning, and it's the meaning that we expect for this expression, but people might be bringing different sorts of meanings to it. Yeah, it's really interesting to see how they interpret it um, in just kind of a free-form question. What does it stand for? Mm -hmm. And then uh, the analysis builds on item response theory, which I know uh, very little about, but I know that it involves kind of like, <laughs> you know, looking at the items and then uh, having difficulty kind of measures for each of the items. Mm -hmm. But you put a little extra spin on it to be able to interpret your results. So just briefly, what was it that you used to make sense of the data that you had? Sure, so I won't go into too many of the technical details, but you're right. We use this Roche model, which is part of this item response theory. The benefit of this Roche model is that it allows us to estimate student ability levels and item difficulty levels at the same time. And what that allows us to do, it puts them on the same scale. So what I can do is I can look at a very particular student and say, your estimated ability level is one, which might be positively related to kind of the, the mean ability level. And then we can say, if you have that ability level, what are the chances that you're gonna solve an item of this difficulty level? And so I can take this exact student and this exact problem and say, based on this analysis, student A has a 95% chance of solving item one correctly, but only a 25% chance of solving item 10 correctly, mm -hmm. for example. So it gives us this nice mapping between ability levels and difficulty levels and gives us this rich information about students' performance on this assessment. I'm speaking with Emily Fife from Indiana University about her article in the Journal of Educational Psychology focusing on math equivalence with algebra and pre-algebra students. So now I'm just curious, um, you said one of the goals was to find out if you have a valid, reliable measure for math equivalence understanding. Um, so. What did this assessment data look like when you took it now to middle school students? Yeah, so the results actually look pretty good. It seems like a pretty reliable and valid assessment for middle school students, um, tapping their knowledge of math equivalents. Um, and so some of our metrics suggest a few things. For example, some of our results suggest that this 
uh, assesses a single dimension. So it's just this knowledge of math equivalence. It's not assessing multiple things. Um, other parts of our results suggest that it is uh, valid in terms of this knowledge progression. So the items that we hypothesized would be easier, what we're calling level one items in the paper, were in fact given the lowest difficulty estimates, meaning they were the easiest items. Mm -hmm. um, and then the items we predicted that were going to be really hard, these level four items that involve thinking about problems without calculating but using these compensatory strategies, those items were in fact the most difficult and had the highest difficulty estimates. And so a lot of our results do suggest that this assessment was able to capture really nice differences in these students' knowledge and in these item difficulties in this middle school sample of pre-algebra and algebra students. Mm -hmm. And the four levels that you talked about are the kind of originated from the elementary level. Mm -hmm. Would you say those four levels are still a useful way of thinking about it, even in the middle school? Yes, I think so. So. Um, this nice rush analysis gives us this beautiful visual um, display of our results. It's called a right map, and it's displayed in the paper, and it kind of shows the distribution of students in terms of their ability estimates, and it also shows this nice distribution of the item difficulty estimates. And so you can see we have this beautiful distribution of students ranging from really low levels of ability estimates to really high levels of ability estimates. And then we also have this nice range of item difficulties. In this middle school sample, the level one items were a little less discriminatory because they were a little bit easy for this sample, which we would expect. Mm -hmm. These are middle school students, not elementary school students. But the remaining levels were really good at teasing apart these individual differences in um, pre-algebra and algebra students' knowledge, particularly these level four items, which I find particularly interesting mm -hmm. because they um, involve this kind of sophisticated reasoning about equations and the equal sign that doesn't always involve heavy computation. It's more about this reasoning of the structure um, and the problem-solving strategies. Right, which is very useful thinking for later when you're doing, when you're fully into algebra and advanced algebra mm -hmm. and you're not actually computing very much, you're <laughs> mostly just moving around the structure of these objects that you're working with. So right, exactly. to have that, it's, it's nice to have a good way, detailed way of looking at that. Um, and speaking of moving into algebra, what was the breakdown if you looked at pre-algebra middle schoolers versus algebra middle schoolers? Yes, yeah, so we did get significant differences by course, by multiple metrics. The algebra students were doing significantly better on this assessment than pre-algebra, which is what we'd expect because the algebra students should have a little bit more formal experience reasoning about the equal sign in multiple contexts, um, thinking about doing operations to both sides, um, and things like that. So. Based on prior research and theory, we expected that difference, and it did fall out in our data that the mm -hmm. algebra students were more um, successful on um, these items than the pre-algebra students. And are these the students that have actually already been taking algebra for a while? Like, it's not like students that are headed to algebra, it's that they've already been in an algebra class. Right, correct. Yeah. Um, so it was near the end of the year when they were kind of wrapping up in their algebra class. They hadn't quite finished it yet, but yes, so they were in yeah. algebra, not um, getting ready for algebra. Right. <laughs> So you saw the difference, but we aren't really sure if the difference is because of the selection of students into those groups or if the difference is because of the experiences that they had in algebra. Yes, that's a good point. So we can't really make um, too many claims about the, because there's lots of differences between students who are in algebra and, who's, and students who are in um, pre-algebra, things like the schools and the classes they're in and their teachers. Um, but we do find that difference here, which is what we would expect um, based on prior theory and, and work. And then the other thing I wanted to ask you about was the relationship between the math equivalents as assessed with these instruments mm -hmm. uh, and then the way that they reasoned about that contextual problem. What did you find there? Yeah, so we found, um, excitingly, that pre-algebra and algebra students' performance on the math equivalents assessment um, was predictive of their ability to interpret this algebraic expression. And so if you'll remember, this item is, you know, I'm going to go purchase four cakes and three brownies, and what does 4C plus 3B stand for? And so that problem, the algebraic expression that they're interpreting, doesn't actually contain the equal sign itself. So it's this more generic, conceptual algebraic reasoning task. And what we find is that their performance on all of these math equivalence items, which are reasoning about the equal sign itself, predicts their ability to interpret this um, algebraic expression correctly. And that's after controlling for age and math course. 
um, and things like that. And so it's an interesting theoretical connection between uh, your understanding of equivalence as assessed with these equal sign items and your ability to reason relationally about an algebraic um, expression. Mm -hmm. So now that you've taken these ideas and this framework and assessments and moved them into the middle school level, what do you think some of the implications are for practice about now having these tools available to us as a field? Yeah, so one, I think it's an excellent tool now for tracking students' understanding. So I think sometimes it's this assumption that once you do get into pre-algebra or pass that and get into algebra, that you have so much experience with the equal sign in these problems that your basic understanding of equivalence and the equal sign is, is pretty near mastery. But what we're finding is there's lots of individual differences in this knowledge, even at this upper level um, in algebra. And so one is it just gives us this nice tool to assess their knowledge, to think about, oh, maybe I should be asking my students um, what the equal sign means, or maybe I should be presenting these interesting compensatory problems where they don't have to calculate, but they have to reason about them. Um, so one, it just gives us this cool assessment tool to think about where our students are at in this knowledge progression. It also gives us a nice um, tool for evaluating the effectiveness of an intervention. Interventions for equivalence knowledge do occur early on because we want to kind of um, nip these misconceptions in the bud really early, but because we're still finding these misconceptions in um, middle school, it's important to design interventions that target these middle school students as well that are in pre-algebra and algebra courses. And so if somebody designs an, an intervention to improve their knowledge of math equivalence, we need to be able to say reliably and validly whether that knowledge was actually increased by the intervention, and this assessment gives us the tool to do that. Mm -hmm. So a lot of that deals with assessing and, like you said, kind of having a really good, valid sense of where the students are and their understanding. Mm -hmm. Do you also think there's any kind of role for using some of the items in instruction? Like, would teachers use level four items but actually actually mm -hmm. use them as instructional devices to try to help students think in new ways? Or is it more like use those items to just check and see where the students are? Oh, no, no. I think this actually serves as a really wonderful springboard for future research in terms of um, incorporating these items into instructions and lessons and things that teachers use in their classroom. And it's not to say that teachers aren't already thinking about these interesting problems, but it does give them this kind of concrete sense of, oh, maybe I can ask it in this way, and that gets at this different level of knowledge that I wasn't targeting before. Um, you know, so asking if 76 plus 49 equals 121, if I subtract 9 from both sides, is that still the same, right? And can you explain without actually doing the computation? Mm -hmm. So it might give instructors these ideas for certain tasks and questions they can ask their students that might just give a little spin to what they're already doing. And potentially, if we had an intervention that targeted these level 4 items, potentially that would be more effective for these um, pre-algebra and algebra students than, say, interventions that targeted these kind of more basic items that were at level one, two, or three on the construct map um, that mm -hmm. you can find in the paper. So yeah, I think you're right. It might actually serve as inspiration mm -hmm. for items that can be used in really critical lessons for these older students. Yeah, I think that's kind of exciting to think about, and it wouldn't be to have teachers, you know, directly instruct the students how to do these level four items, it would be just to broaden the kinds of experiences that they allow students to think about themselves. Exactly, right. So we already know from lots of prior research that um, one of the main views is that these misconceptions arise because of overly narrow experience. Not that teachers are intentionally teaching things about the equal mm -hmm. sign wrong. They just tend to give a lot of problems that have this very narrow format, and the equal sign is always presented at the end of the problem. Mm -hmm. If we can expand teachers' repertoire of these items to give students this really wide variety of experience with lots of different problems and different um, solution strategies, not always computational, but sometimes just reasoning through them, the equal signs in all kinds of places in the problems, then I think that might um, expand their knowledge of equivalence more broadly. Mm -hmm. And one final thing I wanted to touch on from the article was that you have this quantitative data that was analyzed quantitatively, but you also brought in mm -hmm some student work and student explanations and you actually looked at the explanations as part of this study so I wonder if you could just speak to the value that you saw of bringing quantitative and qualitative perspectives mm -hmm. together into the same study. Yeah it was actually a really fun project to do because of that so my background is in psychology and experimental research so I tend to think only in 
these kind of quantitative experimental terms. But in working with this group of authors, including Percival Matthews and Eric Amsel, they often wanted to take this more qualitative approach thinking about, well, what is, well, how are students really reasoning about these tasks, and how are they explaining their performance on these tasks? And we can use their written work and their written explanations to really dig in um, to the knowledge that they're exhibiting. And so it was really fun to go back and forth with this kind of Roche modeling from IRT and getting this kind of beautiful table of data and values, but then also just digging into the actual tests that the students took and thinking about the, the qualitative nature of their responses and kind of going back and forth and seeing how the quantitative results were really supporting the qualitative results and vice versa. Mm -hmm. Well, Emily, thanks so much for describing the study. Um, it's in the Journal of Educational Psychology, so hopefully people can go find that, get some more of the details, see that beautiful figure that you referred to. I can tell you're a quantitative <laughs> researcher because you really speak with passion about that figure. <laughs> um, but, no, it is a helpful way to, to really put together what you were finding. Um, before you go, I actually want to ask one more question that I ask most of my guests, which is, to imagine an alternative reality where you're not an educational researcher, <laughs> is there something else you could imagine yourself doing as a career? Oh, goodness, so many things. Um, mostly I would do research in all of these other areas, thinking about our memory and sleep consolidation and early infancy research, but that's kind of boring because it's still about research. So <laughs> I'll answer by saying I would actually work in a daycare with tiny, tiny infants because I find their um, growth in both motor and perceptual and cognitive skills in that first year of life to be absolutely fascinating. Mm -hmm. So that would be where I landed, I think, in some alternative reality. <laughs> yeah, it is fun. So um, I have my first daughter, my third child, but um, Ruth is six months old, and she started crawling wow. about a week and a half ago, and then just this morning, like a little while before I came in to record this, uh, she pulled herself up onto the rim of her crib, you know, like standing wow. up. Wow! So yeah, we like congratulations. We, yeah, our our morning was you know all standing around and looking at her and praising her for her new accomplishments. <laughs> That's wonderful. I also have a little five-month-old daughter at home right now and doing very similar things, just starting to crawl and rock back and forth, and it's the development is just astonishing. <laughs> yeah, you can almost see it on a daily basis. And if you were in a daycare, you'd have enough infants where like each week you'd have something exciting happening, I'm sure. I know. Yeah, it would be really fun. <laughs> well, Emily, thanks so much for taking the time to speak with us um, about this work. And it, it's really fun to think about algebra with you. So send our regards to the rest of your co-authors. I certainly will. They worked very hard on this paper too. <laughs>